Okay, hey everybody, and welcome to a very awesome bonus video from uh, my friend Nathan Fox. Um, Nathan, I saw this on your brand new uh, DeviantArt account. Uh, if anybody's interested, DeviantArt, uh, Nathan, your username is Nathan Fox Art mm -hmm. on DeviantArt. So I, I saw this very cool tutorial, and I want to talk to you about it. Uh, maybe we can kind of elaborate. Where was this done? So this was done up in the Sierra Nevadas. Uh, it's the mountain range in between California and Nevada, kind of in the foothills leading up to it. It's, uh, it's a great vacation of people who are in the LA area who want to get out into the mountains. That's the direction that we head. And so that's the spot at sunset. And so what was it about this particular moment and this place uh, that really inspired you to um, you know, capture it. The lighting was gorgeous. And I, I can't tell you, Bobby, you know, I grew up not too far from this spot, a couple hours away, but that countryside's familiar to me. So there's a little connection with just growing up in this kind of light and kind of environment because you get these tall yellow grasses and uh, you get brilliant reds from that sunset that really light up the yellow grasses. And then you get the blue skylight coming down from above that gives a little bit of a greenish hue to the, uh, to the yellow grasses. So you get this amazing kind of gray, blue, green with the orange red light shining through the backlighting. And it's this complementary relationship. It's so pretty and it's so hard to get when you're learning uh, but I love that kind of light, and this moment had it. I had to capture it. So is this during, um, I guess, sunset? Sunset. Sunset. Okay, great. Well, there's a huge amount of um, warmth in this painting, even though there are grays and, and cooler tones, and that's what I specifically want to talk to you about today. And you're very kind to... Um, show a little step by step so if we could just start off with the very first uh, step there where it's all yellow and you're using an orange uh, coal erase I guess or yeah I'm using I'm just using a, a orange prisma prisma color pencil in this case it's the Verithin brand mm -hmm. and uh, it puts down a tone that's a little bit water resistant so I can maintain my drawing if I need to and the orange color just blends in beautifully with the scene. So, yeah, I like to put down a tone. I like to wash it. And as a matter of fact, I can I can show you. This is the sketchbook. Make sure it's on the screen. And I did a series of studies earlier in the day. You see up above, and then uh, and then you can see the image down here that was the the finished one. Kind of the uh, my my last hurrah of the evening, hoping you know that it would take and I could get the light before it passed. You do have to work quickly, and that's why I have kind of this minimal approach. So yeah, I need to put that warm down first so I have that backlit luminosity from the sunshine because the sun is setting just behind that tree uh, in the image. I'm just looking at it on my screen. So just to the left-hand side, the sun's setting right there behind the tree. And I'll also say this about it. One thing that was important, why I angled it the way that I did, the road takes you from the foreground and that road leads you right around the corner into the sunset. Composition is really important to me. And so that's just a little element that helps strengthen the, uh, the sunset happening. And you have a bit of a sketch language in here where there's two kind of spherical objects that you're, you're sketching out. Um, one that has kind of like the Pac-Man ghost uh, squiggly <laughs> teeth lines underneath and then the other one, almost like a door to this, uh, to the sphere. Can you tell me what e each of those represented to you? Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm making it a little bigger on my screen to see those specifically. You know, one thing that's, that's nice, one thing that you can look for, because you said it well, there has to be a little bit of an abbreviated design language. So for instance, if there are rounded shapes in the tree line in an image like this, and you want that softness, you want that warmth, you know, it's not gonna be an image that's in any way frightful or, uh, or, or sharp. And so taking advantage of those rounded shapes with the, these foothill trees really have that. I forget the name, but it's some kind of a, a dwarf fir tree with a just beautiful rounded shape. When it's there, you take advantage of it because that rounded shape 
lends itself to a soft, comfortable environment. So that's definitely part of the image. And then the second step, if we can go to the second uh, thumbnail here, um, again, a lot of warm tones. There's a lot of very vibrant red in there and orange. And then you have what looks like a slightly more violet uh, tone there. So in the end result, you know, you can only see a little bit of the orange, a little bit of the red, and I guess just a little bit of that dark purple. Um, at this point, are you still thinking a few steps ahead? Like this is what I'm going to do first, this is what I'm going to do second? Absolutely. Uh, I've done a couple hundred trillion of these sketches, Bobby. It's been really important to me over the last 20 years. And so I do it as often as possible. It's why I use this technique and this approach. I use watercolors. I use a little bit of opaque white gouache to get the opacity when and where I need it. And that's uh, kind of a quick approach. It's must, I love oil painting, but oil painting is just too slow to capture a sunset on site. And so in nature, you know, there are very few saturated colors in nature. You get occasional saturated areas at sunset. You get the occasional uh, flower or mineral that's highly saturated. But primarily in nature, the beauty is in the grays. Warm grays, cool grays, the browns, the, the gray greens. You play those warms and cools and those subtle variations of gray against each other. And instead of being loud and garish, you know, with a lot of oversaturated colors, the cools bring the warms to life and the warms bring the cools to life. So many people talk about, oh man, my paintings turn to mud. All you have to do, you know, mud be just means it's brown on brown on brown or it's gray on gray on gray. You have a gray painting, find an opportunity for some warm accents. You have a dull brown painting, look for those cool atmospheric lights coming down into the shadows. And then those warms just come to life because in this scene, there's just those few spots where the light shines through the environment and the trees are backlit and it creates that warm, you know, those few warm passages of orange backlighting. And those act as key accents in a scene that is primarily made out of warm and cool neutrals. Very cool. So in your mind already, you know that you're going to be putting a lot of uh, uh, grays on top of this to neutralize it and to take it down a bit, just give that feeling of backlit. Yeah, when, when time is of the essence and you don't have time to render, you have to have some kind of a technique that fakes rendering. And so uh, uh, early on, and this is something we actually developed uh, when I was working on the film Prince of Egypt, we wanted this glowing backlit luminosity to the film. And one of the things that we really pushed hard and developed, and, and I had the opportunity to find a comfort zone with, was doing exactly this, starting out with warm washes and then laying the neutrals and the cools over top of it so that there was uh, a luminosity. For instance, you might have a warm object with cool light on it. So you paint the warm first, and then you kind of glaze the cool over top. And you have this vibrant combination of warm and cool that happens automatically. And that's exactly what I was thinking about here. Warm underpainting, which this image primarily did have warm local colors, but then it has all of the cool coming down into the shadows, laying over top of those warms. And so I'm painting the colors in the way they really exist. The warm light and the warm local colors first, and then the cool lights and the shadows laying on top of those. It makes for a nice vibrance. Beautiful. And I, I see you also started mixing in some subtleties in the yellows with some uh, subtle oranges in there as well. Yeah. That's just for, I guess, when I ask you, what, what would that be for? Well, just to maintain that vibrance. Uh, for instance, you see me laying those in first, and I lay them in much more saturated than they really need to be, making sure that the overpainting, this just comes to practice, you know, and uh, making sure that the overpainting uh, leaves enough of that color. So I've got to start with something very saturated, knowing that it's going to get knocked down and knocked down and knocked down as I work. And then, uh, and then at the very end, then I take my opaque white gouache, I add some yellow watercolor to it, make sure it needs some warmth to it. And my very last step you see jumping from number four to the bigger number five image, 
I'm just scumbling that those uh, those raking lights that are falling along the picture plane. Just those raking lights are my very last step. And since they have a nice texture to them in real life, I can just kind of dry brush, just kind of drag my brush across and put that last touch on and then be done. You know, the, the sun is set by that point and I've got to you know, pack up and head home. Some nice textural highlights in the end. Great. And uh, so just talking about the third image and the fourth image a little bit, that's when you start introducing those cools. Correct? Exactly. It's warm grays versus cool grays. The cool grays are in the shadows. Is that right? Absolutely. So for instance, the, the yellow grasses, uh, I put the warm down first. That's the color of the grass. And then I just kind of wash. Sometimes I'll dry brush if I need texture or want texture, or uh, if I want it to be a little smoother or less demanding, you know, if it's a less important area, I'll just put a glaze. I'll just glaze a cool right over top of that to suggest that cool light coming onto it. But one of the things to really watch out for that I notice for a lot of, a lot of my students, uh, one thing they miss is the deep darks, the temperature is actually critical in the deep darks, you know, as we talk about where the warms and cools are and uh, follow up with your question, that's the most common thing that's missed. In nature, there's very rarely, uh, in the deep recesses, the deep shadows, there's very rarely a cold color. You know, if you're painting an iceberg, you're going to get the most intense blues you've ever got in the shadows. Other than that, you're doing a crevice between a log and the ground. You're doing a, a, a drop shadow from a tree. The deep shadows are almost always a dark, warm color. And if you lose that, it's almost as if you've let the lifeblood out of your image. So that's one spot that's commonly missed where a warm temperature is critical. Wow. Okay. And why is that? Why why did those dark, dark tones get warm? That is a good question. Um, I guess it's enough to, uh, to know it and observe it. Um, it's very rare that the actual local color, I'll, I'll put it this, this is what I do know for sure. It's very rare that the local color is cold. I'm trying to think of any time in nature where a deep shadow would, um, uh, would be made by an object that is blue or blue-gray. Maybe there are some granites that are quite cool. But any light that gets in there is going to be bounce light. Any light that's able to shine into that shadow. And bounce light is inherently warm. You know, I don't want to get too far into physics, and I'm, I'm not an expert, so I shouldn't get too far. But when light hits a surface and then bounces, it loses energy. And it loses energy in the form of going from shorter to longer wavelengths. Most of us, pretty much all of us, are aware that longer wavelengths of light are warmer wavelengths. Shorter wavelengths of light are cooler ones. So between local colors typically being warm, you know, um, I don't know, a brown tree trunk or earth or something. And any bounce light that's able to get in there, they typically lean towards the warms. Great. And your final... Kind of move when we're looking at your final image it seems like you've saved the brightest tones for last kind of like the icing on the cake and you start to vary up a lot of your uh, darker tones with some subtle variations of color is that right absolutely yeah it's kind of the fun point because you uh if you do your job right you have a composition that's that's working for you and then you kind of put the, the icing on the cake and uh and if you put that on last, it sits right on top of everything else. There's no rule that you have to do your lights last. Sometimes maybe for certain circumstances you wouldn't want to. But in a case like this, you know, you, you prepare everything for those final lights and then drop them on top because that's what's happening. The light's raking across the tops there. And then, yeah, I'll go into the shadows and uh, do a little bit of, uh, you know, little touch up, a little detail work, a little subtle variation within those to just make sure the image has the uh, luminosity and the sparkle that it deserves, that it really has in real life. Now, with plein air painting, you know, there's so much to learn. There could be a whole entire course on it. I hope there is a course on it in the future. But in this specific case, with a backlit uh, sunset, 
um, environment. If people want to try this at home, I guess to distill the steps here, we first start off with very vibrant, uh, warm tones. Bring in and maybe, and, and maybe Bobby, we could take a quick step back sure. because people are always asking about the materials. And I can just say I, I grabbed. Uh, what I do is I set everything up so it's convenient. I have little fanny pack straps around my waist here. And uh, everything I use fits inside of that. And so I have, uh, you know, I have a little watercolor palette. Um, here it is. And I use a brush. I actually use brushes that are quite big like this. And uh, I don't know, we can put a link or something to a materials list. But uh, people are kind of shocked, you know, because my paintings are typically, they're small. You know, they're this big. I use a sketchbook about this size. And... Uh, I'll just grab an image that might be might be relevant. So you know my my sketches are quite small, but I still use a one inch brush it's this size, wow. and it lets me quickly block in. You know, speed is of the essence for this kind of work when you're trying to capture the momentary effects of light and atmosphere, and so I can quickly block in big passages, or I can use the corner as a chisel tip and just get little fine details with it. So the one inch brush and the half inch brush are, are key for me. And I just use a heavy weight. Uh, this is a sketchbook. It has a, it's made by Canson. I have a materials list we can put a link to somewhere for everybody. Uh, but it has a heavy weight kind of a brown craft paper that's a nice ground to work on. And then uh, watercolors out of the tube, Winsor Newton, white gouache, white opaque gouache. And I squeeze the colors out and I work from there. So uh, those materials are specifically because they're quick and convenient. And that's my starting point. Great. And just in case anybody missed it, out of the tube means that you're not using any water with those watercolors. So I squeeze it, yeah, I squeeze it straight out. I don't have pre, um, you know, I don't have the, the pre-packed ones that have the little tablet of color. Those are too hard. It takes too much work to dig color into. So I squeeze it straight out of the tube, but then I do blend with water for washes. But I actually paint quite thickly at times as well. I have the luxury to paint almost as if it's oil paint. I'll do very thin washes, like you were asking about and mentioning step one and step two. Fairly thin washes, but then I get a little more opaque and a little thicker from there. Fantastic. So if people want to try this at home, and you're doing the same sort of scene with backlighting and it's very warm sunset. Try starting off with warm tones in the beginning, working your way into grays, and then leaving the highlights, the brightest tones, and the variations of the darker tones, the subtleties of them for the end. Is that, is that correct? That, that is a formula for terrible frustration, <laughs> which after less practice than you might think leads towards just the most fun that you've ever had outside with a paintbrush. Fantastic. And for anybody that wants to keep up with Nathan, you could definitely check him out on his brand new DeviantArt page where we're, you can see it at the bottom of the video there. Or if you'd like to learn from Nathan, definitely check out all three of his classes. They're all amazing, great classes. One is designing environments with Nathan Fox. One is dealing with uh, designing with uh, color and light. And the last one is pictorial composition. Three fantastic courses that will surely upgrade your, your level of art dramatically as, as far as I've seen with your students. So thank you so much, Nathan, for taking the time. Well, Bobby, I thank you. I love teaching my schoolism classes. So I'll either see everyone there or see them online at my uh, social media. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bob. Schoolism Live Workshops is a fantastic opportunity to learn from your schoolism teachers live, in person, when you receive education from someone that is known for what they do, successful at it. It's learning on a whole new level, being taught their personal techniques, methods, philosophies that have taken their amazing careers to where they are today. The experience of going to a Schoolism Live workshop is truly education evolved. 
like that. And the thing is that I want to tell you is that I have no idea how to do any of this stuff. I and mean, that's what I want to say to you guys is that you don't need to know the end result of anything. You just need to get it started. Don't let that fear of what the end result might be stop you. And that's why most of us will never do what it is we desire to do because we're afraid of the end result. So people are saying, they're looking at a person and they're saying, okay, I want to represent, I want to capture the idea with, with, a, with an image, right? So this would, might be something similar to what the cavemen were doing, right, with, when they're trying to depict a person. You're seeing someone young and sort of the next generation and you're really, oh my god, I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed because, you know, that's, for a lot of people, that's me up there, right? Even as a working professional, you have to stay sharp. You have to keep evolving, keep learning. Because our industry is evolving. And for artists to keep up, or better yet, get ahead, the best way to do that is to learn from the people that are already there. Kevin Lima, and then of course, Academy Award winner, Brenda Chapman, powerhouse couple. Biggest thanks goes to them. Can we give them a big round of applause? Creativity is problem solving, meaning you have to get to the very heart of the problem before you can even begin to solve it. Hi, I'm Katie. I came all the way from Michigan to come to the Schoolism workshops today. And um, I'm so glad I did. They were amazing. I learned so much. Um, very interactive and uh, picked up some great tips and I hope they continue to do more of them because I'll be coming back. Come check us out and stay tuned as Schoolism Live Workshops visits a city near you.